and welcome to the historynetwork.org podcast. If you'd like to become a patron of the podcast, we would love you to. You can do so for a very nominal amount and it really helps us here. Patreon.com forward slash the history network. Thanks to all our patrons who make this podcast possible. The History Network dot org podcast, season thirty six, episode four, The Siege of Belgrade, fourteen fifty six. This episode was written by Michael Kerr. Michael is an amateur historian from New Zealand with a graduate diploma in history from the University of Auckland. He has a keen interest in Byzantine and medieval Eastern European history after living in Hungary for several years. Twelve years have passed since the disastrous crusader battle of Varna, and three years since the fall of Constantinople to the Ottoman Empire in 1453. Europe is reeling under the relentless pressure of Ottoman advances, Serbia fell in 1455, and Sultan Mehmed the second had now amassed his forces for an invasion of the Kingdom of Hungary. To launch this invasion, he first needs the fortress town of Belgrade, known in Hungarian as Nandorverherver, to fall. Control of Belgrade would allow him to use the Danube to transport troops, cannons and supplies. Despite Ottoman supremacy and widespread European ambivalence, not everyone was cowed. John Hunyadi, a prominent military and political figure in Hungary and beyond, had begun preparations for the anticipated Ottoman attack, with a distinguished military career against the Ottomans starting as early as 1439. Hunyadi steadily rose in fame and fortune. He led raids deep into Ottoman Balkan territory in 1443, which resulted in the Treaty of Zeged between the Ottomans and the Kingdom of Hungary. However, King Ladislaus of Hungary reneged on the treaty a month later, having completed preparations for another crusade against the Ottomans. During this crusade, the infamous Battle of Varna took place, resulting in 30,000 casualties, including King Ladislaus himself, who was killed while leading a charge against the Sultan's retinue. Hunyadi, fighting alongside his mercenaries, narrowly escaped, but was imprisoned by Vlad Dracul, who saw him as insurance against Ottoman attack, or a source of ransom. Hunyadi was eventually freed after Hungarian nobles threatened retaliation. Upon his return to the Hungarian court, Hunyadi was proclaimed regent for the young King Ladislaus V the Posthumous in 1446. He later led an army of about 22,000 into Ottoman territory to join forces with Skanderberg, the Lord of Albania. However, Sultan Murad II intercepted them at the Battle of Kosovo, defeating them in a three-day conflict that resulted in around 17,000 Hungarian, Wallachian and mercenary casualties. Hunyadi retreated to Hungary with his remaining forces, but was captured and imprisoned by Durad Brankovic, the leader of Serbia, due to Hunyadi's numerous raids into Serbian lands. At this time, Serbia was an Ottoman vassal, Hunyadi was released after paying a ransom of a 100,000 florins, and his son Ladislaus was sent as a hostage to Brankovic. The defeat at Kosovo weakened Hunyadi's position in the Hungarian court, leading to years of feuding with local lords as he sought to regain his power and influence. Despite these setbacks, he continued to launch raids against Ottoman forces in Serbia, further angering Durad Brankovic. Nevertheless, Hunyadi remained resolute in his fight against the Ottomans. 
1455, envoys from Ragusa informed Hunyadi of Ottoman preparations for an invasion the following year. In response, Hunyadi sought assistance from the papal legate and financed the recruitment of 5,000 mercenaries. He dispatched these troops to the Belgrade fortress under the command of his brother-in-law, Michael Zlagiyi, the fortress's captain. A year after Constantinople fell, Pope Calixtus III sent Giovanni da Capistrano, a 70-year-old Italian Franciscan friar, to Germany and Hungary to preach for a crusade against the Ottomans. Capistrano, renowned for his organisational skills and powerful oratory, managed to rally 25,000 people for the upcoming crusade. While many of these were inexperienced peasants armed with hoes and scythes, there was also a significant contingent of trained knights and men-at-arms. Despite being poorly equipped, this rugged band was highly motivated, driven by a strong crusading zeal and the promise of indulgences to reduce the punishment for their sins. On hearing of the impending Ottoman invasion, Capistrano led his followers to join forces with Hunyadi. Together, they raised an army of approximately 30,000 to 40,000 troops, though most were ill-equipped and poorly trained peasants. The force included Hunyadi's mercenaries, experienced knights and men-at-arms. Facing them was the formidable Ottoman army of 60,000 to 70,000 troops, including the elite Janissary units. These were Christian children taken as tribute from their families, converted to Islam and trained to serve in the Ottoman military. Mehmed II's armies were victorious almost everywhere, and Hungary appeared ripe for conquest. The country was plagued by internal turmoil under the rule of the inexperienced King Ladislaus the Posthumous. Additionally, its most renowned general, John Hunyadi, had fallen out of favour at court due to the recent defeats and ongoing conflicts with his rival, Count Ulrich of Terje, who enjoyed the king's support. Despite receiving little assistance from the Hungarian king and nobles, Hunyadi travelled to Belgrade. Belgrade is the gateway to the Hungarian plains. It is strategically located where the Danube splits into two, the main branch heading north into Hungary and Austria and the Sava branching off west into modern-day Croatia. The fortress of Belgrade sits on the southwestern shore of the Danube with one side facing land and the other side surrounded by the confluence of the Danube and Sava rivers. Capistrano arrived near Belgrade on July the 2nd, though on the opposite side of the river, while the Ottomans reached the city the following day, positioning themselves outside the main walls. Hunyadi was delayed by skirmishes with Ottoman forces. Sultan Mehmed II divided his army, placing his Anatolian forces on the left by the bank of the Sava River, and his European forces on the right against the bank of the Danube, both facing the main walls of Belgrade. Determined to capture the city quickly and continue his advance into Hungary, Mehmed set up a naval blockade from the north on the Danube and deployed over 200 cannon and mortars to bombard the city's defences. Hunyadi and Capistrano strategized on how to relieve the besieged forces in Belgrade, recognizing that the constant bombardment and the naval and land siege were depleting their supplies, and the fortifications would not hold indefinitely. Hunyadi assembled a small fleet of riverboats to transport part of his army to the city to relieve the exhausted troops during nightly artillery bombardments that prevented rest and repairs to the defences. Using his modest armada, Hunyadi launched an assault on the Ottoman fleet, which significantly outnumbered his own. His troops followed along the river bank, and he sent messages to the city's defenders to prepare for battle. The assault on the Ottoman fleet lasted around five hours with ships from the Belgrade fortress attacking the Ottomans from the rear. 
the Ottoman fleet eventually gave way, allowing Hunyadi to transport his men and much-needed supplies into the city. Despite the setback with his fleet, which broke the siege and allowed the defenders a lifeline for supplies and reinforcements, Mehmed continued his bombardment. By July 21st, three large breaches had been made in the walls. Sensing the time was right for the main assault, Mehmed ordered his troops to attack. The defenders anticipated this and lined up in the breaches created by the Ottoman artillery. Although they repelled several attacks, the janissaries eventually forced the defenders back into the city, slowly advancing towards the inner keep. As Ottoman forces swarmed in, pushing the defenders further back, they made a critical error by failing to clear the outer walls of Hungarian defenders. These defenders then attacked the Ottomans from the rear, setting tarred wood and other flammable materials on fire, creating a barrier between the Ottoman forces inside the city and those outside the walls. The Ottoman forces within the city became surrounded and cut off. Initially pushed back to the keep, the fortress defenders rallied at this site, while those on the outer walls defended against repeated Ottoman attempts to breach the city again. The trapped Ottoman forces were bombarded with flaming missiles and anything the defenders could throw and ignite, exhausted and burning inside their armour, with no water and little hope of rescue, many Ottomans burned alive. Even the elite janissaries began to panic as they fought for their lives against the flames. The scene became a living hell and many tried to flee or were eventually cut down. The assault was a disaster for the Ottomans, with the loss of so many elite troops severely sapping their morale. The next day revealed the magnitude of their defeat as blackened corpses of the Ottoman soldiers and janissaries littered the fortress grounds. The stench of rotting burnt flesh permeated the city. Despite this victory, Hunyadi knew that Mehmed was not yet defeated and that the Ottoman troops would regroup for renewed attacks. He ordered the Crusaders and other troops to stay within the fortress, repair the defences and prepare for the next assault. However, events soon spiralled out of his control. Some defenders from the city spontaneously left and set up opposite the Ottoman rear lines. John of Capistrano, armed only with a staff, either led them or joined them later, along with many of his ratbag band of crusaders. He proclaimed, This is the day of victory for which we have waited. Let us go across and climb up to the city. Don't fear the Turks. We can eat them up like bread. The excited group of around 2,000 crusaders began taunting the Ottoman forces. Although Capistrano initially tried to send them back into the city, they urged forward towards the Ottoman rear lines. They attacked the artillery crews who had not prepared any defences, nor expected an assault, and captured the guns. The success of this spontaneous attack inspired many more crusaders to join. Capistrano managed to create some order out of the chaos, preventing the crusader forces from being outflanked. Panic began to spread within the Ottoman ranks. Hunyadi, initially sceptical in expecting the experienced Ottoman army to crush the peasants, was surprised when neither the crusaders returned to the fortress nor were defeated. Seizing the opportunity, Hunyadi surged forward with his troops and professional mercenaries, joining the battle alongside Capistrano and the Crusaders. The battle raged for several hours, with Mehmed himself joining the fray, but ultimately being wounded and forced to withdraw. Seeing their sultan flee the battlefield, the Ottoman forces began to falter and were pushed back by Capistrano and Hunyadi. Leading their troops, Capistrano and Hunyadi overran the Ottoman camp, forcing the enemy to flee while burning what they could. Mehmed retreated with his remaining forces all the way back to Constantinople. The victory was miraculous. An army composed mostly of peasant forces had managed to defeat the elite troops of the Ottoman Empire, saving Hungary for the time being. 
However, the triumph came at a great loss. Scores of crusaders and defenders were injured or killed, and the Belgrade fortress, though defended, had been breached and urgently needed repairs. Although the immediate Ottoman threat had been averted, the worst was yet to come. A plague swept through the crusader camp, claiming many lives, whom Yadi himself succumbed to the illness several weeks after the victory, and John of Capistrano died a few months later in a nearby town, also a victim of the plague. Hunyadi was eulogised by friends and enemies alike. Pope Calixtus III lamented, The light of the world has passed away. Even his greatest adversary, Mehmed the Conqueror, praised Hunyadi upon learning of his death, stating, Although he was my enemy, I feel grief over his death because the world has never seen such a man. Upon hearing of the victory, Pope Calixtus III ordered church bells throughout Europe to toll at midday, first to solicit prayers for the defenders and then to commemorate their triumph, a tradition that endures to this day. The victory of the Crusader forces under Capistrano and Hunyadi's leadership has been debated as accidental. It remains unclear if the Crusader attack on the Ottoman camp was planned or spontaneous, lacking definitive evidence either way. It seems unlikely that Hunyadi would risk such a bold manoeuvre given his years of experience fighting the Ottomans, which could have easily led to the annihilation of the Crusader forces. Capistrano, initially attempting to bring the Crusaders back to the fortress, found events escalating beyond his control. Whether the attack on the Ottoman forces was orchestrated or opportunistic, it's still a matter of historical inquiry. The Ottoman forces appeared disorganised and unprepared, possibly still reeling from their previous deceit, and were slow to respond to the assault. Quick to recognise the opportunity after witnessing the success of the Crusaders, Hunyadi swiftly rallied his forces and pressed the attack. Despite its accidental nature, the hard-won victory decisively routed the Ottomans, forcing them to retreat to Constantinople. Capistrano urged the Pope to call for a new crusade to reclaim the Balkans, Constantinople and even Jerusalem. However, Europe was weary and too drained for another crusade despite the tremendous victory. After Hunyadi's death, intrigue and conflict erupted between Ladislas, the posthumous, and Hunyadi's sons, exacerbated by tensions between Austria and Hungary. King Ladislaus returned to Hungary after initially seeking refuge in Austria during the Ottoman attack. Friction escalated with Hunyadi's sons, leading to Ladislaus Hunyadi and Matthias Hunyadi being condemned for high treason, though only Ladislaus Hunyadi was executed. The captain of Belgrade Fortress during the battle, Michael Zilagyi, rebelled against the king in protest, sparking civil war among lords loyal to King Ladislaus and those lords of the Hunyadi family. Subsequently, King Ladislaus took young Matthias Hunyadi to Prague, where he unexpectedly died, speculated to be by poison. Matthias Hunyadi later ascended to the throne of Hungary, and became one of its greatest rulers, reigning for over 32 years and remaining a beloved figure in Hungarian folklore and literature to this day. Well, thank you, Michael, for writing that intriguing episode for us. If you would like to write an episode for us, or would like to suggest a podcast subject that you think we've not covered before, just drop us a line, info at thehistorynetwork.org. For that, again, please do become a patron of the podcast, patreon.com forward slash thehistorynetwork. And thanks again for listening. You've been listening to the thehistorynetwork.org podcast, written by Michael Kerr, read by Nick Barker.